Okay, we're back. We're live. We're Think Tech Talks here on Monday, January 27th in the Soest Hour. We're talking about the airburst of infrasound. Wow, with Milton Garces, uh, uh, director of the Infrasound Institute, I think, and uh, Eric Williams, the Hawaii, and both of them are with the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology from Soest, except they're not in Manoa today. Where are you guys? Our, our lab is uh, in Kona. And this is the Infrasound Lab, and my colleague here, Brian Williams, he's an analyst and a field engineer. Mm -hmm. So uh, we pretty much uh, keep data flowing, keep the sound always on. The, never, the signal never dies, so we're always picking up stuff from everywhere. Well, as I said before, uh, you know, we first uh, started talking a few minutes ago, this, this, will, this will expand my consciousness. I had never heard the term uh, infrasound until this show. I'm sorry to say, I'm sorry to admit my ignorance. Uh, but why are you on the Big Island? Is there something about infrasound that makes the Big Island attractive in some way? Um, yeah, this is where the geophysics happens. We have a volcano uh, very close by. Um, we have our earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanoes here. And so uh, that is where we are, we, we, where we things shake and blow up. Okay, <laughs> all right. So, um, Milton, how did you get to be director of the Infrasound Institute? Uh, tell us about your career up till now. Well, uh, it started um, in 1992. I was walking through the jungle in, uh, in uh, Costa Rica around Arnold Volcano. And I knew there was a volcano out there somewhere, but it was all foggy, it was full of clouds, and I couldn't see a thing, really. All I could hear was monkeys and rain. <laughs> Well, you and know, then, Costa Rica, right? Yeah, that's right. You know, it's like food map. <laughs> so, uh, next thing I know, this, this thing just exploded. Just a huge bang in the dead of fog. You couldn't see a thing, but you could really see that something was happening there. And it really dawned on me, you know, we could use this. We could use this to get a, an, an awareness of what's really happening, even on the absence of vision. And that kind of planted the seed and, you know, 30 years later, something actually came to fruition. It took a little while for things to actually grow, but uh, uh, at that time, there was maybe a handful of people doing this, and uh, now it's a pretty much a growing community. There's a lot of interest in it. It's a lot more applications. So um, it's been very satisfying to watch the field grow. So should I tell you what Infrasound is, at least according to my understanding of it? Uh, only after you tell me uh, what, what training you had and what degrees you have to qualify <laughs> you to tell me what Infrasound really is. <laughs> Sounds good. So um, I had an undergraduate in, um, in physics. Uh, I started with astronomy, and then um, if at the time I had found like solar astrophysics, I would have, probably would have stuck with it. But I spent many, many nights looking at very little dots of light. And, uh, and I realized I really like the sun. I really like sun, I, I like nature. And so I migrated towards the earth sciences. So after I got my degree in physics, I went towards oceanography at the uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh -huh. I started in Florida Tech, um, BS in Physics, then PhD in Oceanography uh, at Scripps. Uh, but during that time, I actually concentrated on volcanoes. And I started looking at underwater volcanoes. And I thought, boy, that is a really difficult problem because you cannot get to them. So, well, maybe starting with land volcanoes would be easier. <laughs> Little <laughs> did I know. <laughs> it was it's a really difficult problem to begin with, but it is more tractable because you can physically go there and place instrumentation at a reasonable cost. And so that's how it started. Um, and okay, then... So, um, I, okay, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I don't want to stop you. Yeah. That's all right. So, um, PhD in uh, UCSD at Scripps. Then I went to Alaska with Alaska Volcano Observatory. And that was really fun. I uh, got to deploy instruments all over the Lushan Arc and see bears and wolves and really big things in very cold weather. Wow. That's when I realized that I, I should get back to the tropics, so I came to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> You've had it on both ends of the spectrum, eh? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, so, so take, before we get to an introduction of Eric Williams, uh, let's... Uh, oh, Brian Williams, I'm sorry, apologies. That's uh, right. Can, can, you, can you tell us, Milton, what, what uh, infrasound is so we sort of start to get a handle on this conversation? It's essentially the same thing we use for communication, but on a level that we cannot hear. Um, so below about 20 hertz, 16 cycles per second, we start losing tonality. We don't hear tones anymore. What we feel is vibration. And so if you were immersed in an infrasound field, you know because everything's shaking inside of you. Mm -hmm. So it physically moves you. And it's there all the time, continuously. A strong wind will create infrasound, or the ocean oscillations, or big surf. 
but it goes right through you and you don't hear it, so you forget it's there unless it's really loud, in which case it physically moves you. And what about the Grammys last night? They moved me. <laughs> That's all audio. There's a little bit of sub, you know, if you look at the upstep, they're getting deeper and deeper. The stuff that really shakes the subwoofer, that's approaching our field. Okay, okay. All right. <laughs> and and uh, Brian, tell me about your background and, and where are you with regard to the uh, Infrasound Institute? Okay. Uh, let's see here. I, I started out, uh, let's see, in Montana Tech over in Butte. Um, and then uh, studied seismic uh, surveying. And then I... Uh, <laughs> went to a Antarctica for my master's and uh, did yeah, the uh, same problem with you know the the spectrum of temperature. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it broadens your spectrum. Yes, exactly. And uh, so yeah, like I said, I started out in seismic, so uh, it's a little different. And then um, after I graduated, I was just looking around for jobs, and uh, like you said, I I never heard of infrasound either, and I was like, wow, this sounds really interesting. And then also, you know. Living in Hawaii sounded great too, so I hopped on board. So, so here we are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you're part of the institute also in uh, the Institute of uh, Geophysics and Planetology and so west and so forth. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, work under. Yeah, under. You guys are working together. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, uh, I guess the question I would put to you is, why do we care, actually? <laughs> All that stuff, it, it brings you into some, it, it's listening essentially, it's an extension of our sense of hearing and uh, just like listening, if you pay attention, you might see things coming before they hit you. Uh, once upon a time, uh, when we lived in small valleys, in small communities, the audio range was the primary concern of interest for us, right? Uh, you know, what's that person doing? Is there a cyber tooth? It, it's, a, it's a tiger coming our way. Uh, but as our species expands their scope and breadth of interest as we become more responsible for things. It's also important to extend our awareness of the world around us. So what creates infrasounders are essentially big things that blow up, things that pose threats of uh, either regional or global scales. Examples are volcanic eruptions, for example. And uh, a, a real, my, what I started in was, okay, how can we provide early warning for volcanic eruptions, right? Mm -hmm. And the zero authority question is, it's, uh, who cares, like you said? Well, anybody who flies to Hawaii cares. Anybody who climbs on a plane to get uh, from Alaska to Indonesia cares very much, because planes and ash don't mix very well. Mm -hmm. It tends to take them down. So if you can give early warning, there's a big eruption going on right now in regions that are poorly monitored, that gives you an ability to avoid the nasty stuff, go around it. Uh, there's a cost associated with that. You have to drop passengers and put more fuel. And so the more advanced notice you have that this is happening, the better you can plan ahead. So the Institute studies infrasound to see how, what kind of events on this planet, and maybe from other places, uh, it can identify and, and what to make how, and measure all that, and what to make of it to interpret that and, and try to get useful data so we can plan, predict, uh, protect, and so forth. And that's, and, and that, and that is something that isn't happening everywhere, is it? I mean, it sounds, Milton, like you've been a founder, a forerunner, a, a rather a, you know, somebody who has followed this from the beginning of it as a, as a science. Um, so, I mean, how widespread is this science? Are there, are there institutes like yours all over the world, or are you one of the few? Well, at, at the turn of the century, or before the turn of the century, there wasn't very much. But what really uh, picked up the interest was the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty uh -huh. in 1996. Uh -huh. So the Infrasound Lab was founded to monitor clandestine nuclear tests in the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. And this is the way you can do that at great distance. So there's Correct. a real benefit. You don't have to be sitting on top of it to know it blew up. You can yes. be halfway around the world and you can, you can say, well, gotcha, I, I saw what you did. <laughs> That's right, we saw that, exactly. And uh, also for discrimination, because if something is above ground versus on the ground, you create a very different signature. And so these are the kind of things that uh, we're, we're listening for anomalies. Okay. And this exactly changes from the normal. Yeah. So just, to, just looking at, uh, you know, the blurb I have on you. So um, you, have, you have meteors. We talk about the Russian meteor. You have nuclear underground and maybe overground tests. 
Um, you have, si I don't know, seismic events uh, qualifies uh, for that. Maybe, maybe Brian's seismic experience is relevant uh, in inf infrasound. I don't know. We'll have to ask him. Um, and what other kinds of things? I guess it's in the it's in the, in nature. Yes. And it's in large noisy events, and I say noisy, I mean really noisy, um, and that uh, and that's what infrasound is about. Am I right? Very much so. And uh, the stuff that we create, I think, with the notable exception of um, the really big nuclear tests that happened at the Cold War, it's pretty small in comparison to the stuff that nature throws at us. So, uh, something big enough, for example, the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami in Japan, it's it's so big and it's so deep in terms of vibration that everything's connected. It really connects the whole planet. And so the distinction between seismic and underwater acoustics and above acoustic, it becomes a little bit more blurred. Everything becomes very connected and the whole earth is, is doing these spherical gong oscillations. It's, uh, it, it becomes uh, uh, very holistic at that stage. So I suppose you could take some device to measure infrasound and just, um, just let it sit there and, and wait for it to report to you there's been a big sound somewhere, and then you can add that, and when you find out what that was, you can add that to your list of interesting sounds that you will now monitor going forward. Um, you know, I mean, I have the sense that there are not that many sounds on the list yet. How many sounds, I mean, is it half a dozen? Is it a dozen? Is it 50? Is it 100? What are you, what are you watching for here? But to, to address one of your earlier questions, at, at the turn of the century, there was only a handful of us. And uh, yes, we had a very, this was a problem. We only had a limited type of events list that we could process and, and train our kind of identification algorithms. But um, now, because the Comprehensive uh, Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization has expanded the breadth and has become training, any, in all the countries that are, are part of the United Nations are signatories of the CTBT. Uh, now are developing their own capabilities. So now we're at the stage where, thank God, we can actually concentrate on specific regions of interest, specific events. Before the, the world was our oyster, right? we had to do everything, but now we can split up and pay more attention at the, at the variety. And what makes it sound different is the long propagation paths, you see? If you're close by, you have very little uh, distortion from here to the microphone that's on this device in front of me. Uh -huh. But if you're a few thousand, a few thousand kilometers away, a lot of can happen in that path. And uh, for example, in the Russian meteor, it got picked up in Antarctica, not once, but twice. And so a lot happens that colors that signature, really gives it a lot of texture, a lot of complexity. So now you start talking about the modification of the atmosphere on a very large corridor, so to speak and how it changes the sound field. So even the same source can have a very different signature at a far enough distance. So is this about air? I remember uh, I saw something on television the last few days um, which, which reminded me that there isn't any sound without air, um, yes, that you can't transmit sound without air. So, so that means it has to travel through our atmosphere, whatever our atmosphere is like. Uh, am I right about that? That's yeah. correct. At, at the scales that we work with within our sound, then yes, we need the atmosphere. And as you know, the atmosphere is always changing. And yeah. the running joke is the day we can forecast exactly how the sound field is going to propagate will be the day that we can forecast the weather precisely. So we're not going to hold a breath for this. <laughs> well, is weather on your list? I mean, if there's a big storm somewhere a thousand miles away, will you, will you be able to tell the, you know, the, the sound of that from your instruments here? Uh, there are some people who um, uh, concentrate on tornadoes. Uh, we look at the hurricanes, and not just hurricanes, but the uh, excitation of uh, ocean swells by the severe storms and how they generate a sound field that can give you, again, early warning for what's coming at you. Okay, well, it sounds to me like your list of events and, uh, you know, uh, sound originating things that happen is probably increasing with the sensitivity of your instruments and it must be a, a, a lot longer that list today than it was when you first got involved in this Milton. It also sounds to me like all of this is relevant to uh, climate change somehow and that if, if events, uh, you know, nasty storms for example are created by climate change then you're involved 
it, you're involved in that science. You're involved in identifying those changes in storms and and predicting climate change type events. Am I right? Uh, it's an exciting time, and if you look at I'm going to introduce the concept of a parallel Earth. You see, we, we have all this data collected uh, from the planet and say it's, it's good for about 50 years, but only on the last 30 years do we have really good, reliable, atmospheric kind of climatology and data. And But all this data is very sparse, right? It's collected here and there. And there's a whole community of people who are concentrated on creating this piecewise, continuous planets, kind of like this model Earths that we can start querying for 30-year cycles right now. We only have 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. For in-person, we have 10 years. And now we begin interrogating this old, you know, baseline data. It's like, okay, what, what is hidden within this envelope at these time scales? And so we begin to get answers now because we have enough duration. So we look at climate change, you have to look at decades to centuries, right? Yes. We're just starting along that path now where we have a decade. All right, now we can start looking at patterns as they emerge and start putting it together in this, essentially this model Earth that we can incorporate all the physics inside of it and start getting answers about where we're going to go based on where we are. Oh, this is getting more and more exciting. Uh, I'm getting a vision of, uh, you know, a sort of a 360 measurement device that measures everything that happens, everything that can hear, and then you wait for changes, and then you try to interpret the changes against the baseline, and you have all kinds of data going through. This makes me, this, this actually makes my head hurt. Uh, it makes me want to take a break. So I think if you guys don't mind, we'll take a short break. Uh, that's Milton Garces and Brian Williams uh, in, in the uh, Infrasound Institute on the Big Island, part of the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. And this is the SOWEST Hour in Think Tech Talks. And we're talking about uh, air bursts and infrasound. We'll be right back after this short break. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry with the Think Tech Commentary. The PUC has established an investigative docket to determine the advisability of an undersea cable connecting the Oahu and Maui electrical grids. It has scheduled public meetings on both Oahu and Maui to invite comments on the proposal. The PUC is investigating whether a transmission cable between the two islands is in the public interest and whether the benefits to ratepayers would exceed the costs of the cable, which DBET estimates would be $700 million. The PUC also wants to know about development risks and how they would be mitigated. With the remarkable increase in PV in the islands and the availability of new grid technologies, it may be possible for each island to generate renewables that meet its own demand and to have separate renewable grids for each island instead. At the same time, an island that depends heavily on a source of renewables, such as PV, may be vulnerable to local changes in the weather or an unanticipated problem with that single method of energy generation. The ultimate question for the PUC, then, is not simply whether an undersea cable is good for Hawaii, but how we can achieve layered redundancy for a resilient statewide system. ThinkTech believes that a great state needs ample power distribution and that the proper approach is to start with this undersea cable, not only to bring the separate island grids and the state together, but as part of a strategy to achieve the security and safety of redundant systems. I'm Nicole Horry with this ThinkTech commentary. Mahalo. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're at Think Tech Talks here on Monday, January 27th in the SOWEST Hour, talking about airbursts of infrasound with Milton Garces and Brian Williams of the Infrasound Institute on the Big Island, joining us by Skype, uh, and they're part of the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology in SOWEST. So, uh, yeah, one, one loose end was, uh, you know, how big is the, the scientific community around infrasound? Uh, how many other organizations, for example, in the state of Hawaii look into infrasound and in the country? What is it like? Well, um, within the state of Hawaii, we've teamed up with the uh, uh, USGS, the Hawaii Volcano Observatory. We have a very nice network now in the state of Hawaii uh, that covers uh, a big island. We have a number of uh, stations over here. We have Maui and we have Kauai. So now we're looking at the regional events, what's happening within the state, and um, uh, essentially try to look for anomalies in the sand field and what that tells us about uh, the changes in the, in the climatology or ocean conditions. Uh, Brian, can you move a little to your right so we can see uh -oh. you? 
And maybe you guys can explain all those graphics right behind you. It looks very exciting. What is that? <laughs> so these are uh, some of the sources that we have. Uh, uh, we have big waves. Uh, for example, now in winter, the whole island is lit up. And we can see the west side. Every time there's a big swell, we have a really nice... Uh, and anybody who lives by the shoreline gets this. You get a big swell and the whole shoreline just shakes. Well, we can pick this up really far off too. So we're up the mountain, we're about you know five kilometers away from the shoreline and we pick that up very nicely. And uh, from the ocean also come tsunamis. And that's an ex example uh, for, for Tohoku. We had an um, infrasonic signal that arrived in Hawaii about four hours before the tsunami itself. And so we're looking into, okay, how can that be a smoking gun? All right, it's definitely coming. And uh, the tsunami moves at about 200 meters per second, sound moves at about 340 meters per second. So if you're close by, it won't give you much, but if you're far away, it will give you enough information for sure. Oh, wow. Uh, I, get, I get the feeling that, that the infrasound and sound is, is uh, it's one of a number of ways to measure these large events. Would you say these days, in the, you know, in the, the maturation of the science, is it the primary way to identify an event? Or is it a secondary way to confirm the, you know, the already known existence of an event? At, at this point, uh, I think the community, most of the science, is moving towards not just having one technology for everything, because there's always ambiguity and there are always vulnerabilities in technology. And so, infrasound is definitely a good way to corroborate. For volcanic eruptions, it's a very effective way to do it, because what drives an eruption is the excess pressure and we're measuring that directly. Uh, for tsunamis, it's a derivative. We Actually, we didn't know it existed until we discovered it after Sumatra. This is when we found out tsunamis create infrasound. It's like, oh, wait. So a lot of discoveries has been happening over the last decade or so. Uh, for surf, uh, the best way to see the swell, of course, is to have an ocean buoy out there. You can see it passing by and, oh, here's the swell. What the acoustic tells you is how intense did the wave break? What so if you wanted to follow tsunamis mm -hmm. I mean, in, a, in a perfect world, um, then you would use that existing system of the ocean buoy, yes. uh, which uh, you know uh, measures the, 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 the swell and, and if it interprets anything off a baseline and, and tells you, whoops, there's a tsunami coming your way. Um, but you would also look at in, infrasound um, to see the, the, the breaks, that, that where it's breaking on a given shore. And then you can tell it. Uh, you can tell exactly how how big it is uh, as it moves across moves across the ocean and hits landmass. Am I right? Well, actually, for the tsunami, it was even weirder. It looks like you guys get closer together. I mean, it, <laughs> you're, you're, there it is. Oh, that's so much better. Yeah. Yeah. The, the tsunami was. It's, it's a pretty strange one, and we think it has to do with the actual vertical excitation. The, you know, when the tsunami, when the earthquake thrust you know, and it shifts over, it lifts the ocean. And we think this is what just produces a pulse. And uh, the best way to do it for tsunamis will be, of course, with the with the dark buoys and also ocean bottom pressure sensors, because they're measuring it as it goes over them. Yeah. That is like as close as you can get at row GH and all that. But um, the, uh, there's other methods too. Uh, the GPS network has become very, uh, uh, very interesting lately in picking up the signals as they propagate through. Uh, what they're picking up is this, Infrasonic signals in space, which is really, so, like you said, is you need air, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how does waves get there, right? There's, I mean, we're, we're measuring at like 150, 300 kilometer heights. There's barely any air over there. It's yeah. a plasma. Yeah, yeah. But, but you have this high electron density up there that actually propagates sound waves. <laughs> <laughs> so you're really starting to, you know, you're really starting to alter the way that you perceive sound propagation at different environments, different in plasmas of all things. Uh, and so for infrasound, what we got is once the earthquake produces this displacement, it generates sound that moves at the speed of sound. So we don't have to wait for the tsunami to arrive to shore. So am I right to also to think that, uh, you, that you don't have to have the same kind of, you know, buoy, buoy infrastructure all over the ocean with a buoy here and a buoy there and, and um, you know, a whole network connecting them by radio or some, some way? Uh, mm -hmm. That you you can do it all from like one unit uh, to measure thousands of miles kilometers in all directions, and you don't have to have repeaters. 
you don't have to have a, a network that goes out into the area where the sound is being generated originally. Am I right? Uh, we can do it remotely, but what we do is uh, we we work with uh, antennas, acoustic antennas, so we can tell direction. And that allows us to help us discriminate different types of sources. Uh, but also, if you want to get early warning, you want to be kind of close. So the closer you are, the earlier the, the warning is. So you want to kind of compromise at some point. We do still deal with satellite communications and all these things, but we're cheap and we're on land. And that makes maintenance easy. It makes communications easier, so we can uh, uh, tag along existing infrastructure. infrastructure and, and we already have a global network, the global network of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. So we already have global coverage, and it's already running for nuclear monitoring. So are you, are you getting data, are you, are you in the Big Island getting data from other places, other continents that you're able to interpret on a sort yes. of a, a, you know, a, a global scale? Yes. Impressive. Impressive. Um, okay, so what does it look like, this thing? I, I have the, you know, does it look like a radar? Does it look like a crystal, crystal uh, radio? Uh, what, what, is, what does it look like that picks up all this sound? Can you see how on the back there's, um, there's uh, one of our stations is in Dio Garcia, an example of something that's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. This is the station that picked up the Sumatra uh, tsunami uh, signature. And they picked it up from the Bay of Bengal region of all places. But uh, we're, we thought that island was going to be gone because, you know, it's just a little atoll it's laying in the middle of the, in the Indian Ocean. So we thought it was going to be destroyed. But as it turned out, it's, it's so small that the tsunami pretended it wasn't there. It just went right by it. Uh. You know, just like a little cork bobbing on the surface. It didn't affect it. It just went right through it. So we picked up a beautiful signal from it. And what you have is seven sensors that are deployed and then look at the time of flight from sensor one to sensor two like our ears do right yeah this is how you tell something's coming from this and or that way because it arrives in one ear first and then the other and doppler then doppler it kind of it's uh, essentially time of flight and you if you point your head towards the source then the signal arrives in both ears at the same time and it adds constructively in your brain and it sounds louder yeah that's what we do with all these microphones we kind of align them so it points towards where the source came from and there we go. Now that's how we know where it came from. So where do the microphones come from? Radio Shack? <laughs> <laughs> They're a little bit uh, pricier than that. Uh, the, the French make some, the um, Americans make some also, and then there are, uh, there are more of these in the market now. Before there was only one or two, and now there's uh, at least half a dozen you can choose from. I'm just curious, well, how big is the microphone physically? Is it bigger than my hand? Oh, it's, uh, it's about kind of this big, so it looks like a blender a little bit. <laughs> 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 and is it, does it have a horn, like a, mega, a megaphone kind of horn, where it collects nope. the sound and focuses the sound? No, no, it's just a hole in the sensor and the air comes in and shakes it up. That's it. Okay. Now, now then, say the one in Diego Garcia, is it, is it manned? Is there so, do you have somebody there uh, who, who stands by and makes sure that it's working and it's on and it's, you know, gathering and, and transmitting data? It's actually sitting all by itself in an, an old coconut copra plantation, uh, sitting out there with the coconut crabs, and uh, it's run out of solar power. It's completely independent, standalone, very environmentally friendly, hiding in the bushes, and uh, it connects to the radio, and then we get the data via satellite here in Hawaii. Brilliant. So it, it goes. So it collects the data. It sends the data by way of satellite, and yep. then you you can pull it off the satellite, so you can put it into your system for interpretation. It goes to Vienna, and then it bounces back yeah. to us, and then we look at it coming in real time. So, you know, within five seconds, it's here. Ha! Huh. That's exciting to be in this area. You feel like you're part of a global experience every yeah. day, every minute. And these things running 24 by 7, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, so uh, after we come back from this break, I'd like to know exactly what you do with it. And I'd like to know a little about the software and the equipment you use to interpret it. What kind of interpretation, you know, what kind of model do you build and what kind of information can we pull out of that model? That's a multiple compound question, but it is. it's a fair <laughs> question. That's Milton Garces and Brian Williams on the Big Island joining us by Skype here at the SOAS Tower. We'll be right back after this short break. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows 
tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Olalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Ar on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. We're back. We're live. We're at Think Tech Talks here in the Soest Hour on Monday, January 27th, with Milton Garces and Brian Williams of the Infrasound Institute on the Big Island, joining us by Skype uh, as part of our Soest Hour every Monday. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, just, just to get a handle on um, how this works, so that so it comes down by way of satellite, you can you can get it down into your equipment, and then it's a lot of beeps and boops and 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 bits. Uh, what do you do with that? Well, let's um, let's pick an example. It is the the Russian meteor that came out down now uh, this February, right? Mm -hmm. That that was one of the biggest explosions we've had in the atmosphere since the Cold War, and uh, when you look at the equivalent yield in TNT, it's about 500 kilotons of TNT. Now, when you scale that to nuclear, there's there's a factor of two. What happens with a nuclear explosion is that half of the energy goes into electromagnetic radiation, the stuff that microwaves you and fries you. Yeah. And then the other half goes into the explosion poles, right? Yeah. Whereas TNT, it all goes into explosion poles. So 500 kilotons of uh, TNT is about one megaton nuclear. So when you think about the intensity and magnitude of that uh, meteor, it's about a one megaton nuclear explosion. That's substantial. It's a good thing nobody was under it. it there was actually uh, the you know Chelyabinsk, uh, the name after the meteor's name is uh, is uh, used to be a, a secret Soviet nuclear facility actually. And uh, if such an event had happened over Los Alamos, for example, a lot of people would have gotten very twitchy on the red buttons, right? Yeah. You think uh, the NSA had anything to do with this? I'm certain they did. <laughs> 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 I'd like to clear the, any, any humans of any wrongdoing. This is a, a, pretty much a beast from space, you know? <laughs> I think I saw a movie like that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, okay, be, so this is a this is a huge big uh, equivalent to a huge big big uh, nuclear explosion. Then, what happened? So, so you, the, you saw it. Oh, uh, we we picked it up very nicely in the system, but we picked it up. Uh, we we cannot we do not at present record all the data here at the lab. There's just too much of it. No. So when uh, when the event happened. Uh, we went to the U.S. Uh, National Data Center, which is in um, uh, Patrick Air Force Base in Florida, and we begged them for the data, and they said, sure, have fun. And they sent us all the data from the network. Okay, the whole the thing, whole the, the global data. It was, it was a wonderful, beautiful thing. All of a sudden, like, once again, here's this beautiful event. They, I asked for three days of data. And uh, well, the first thing we did was figure out, okay, which is the nearest station, which is in Kazakhstan. Uh -huh. And uh, that that thing was massive, you know, and it was recorded beautifully. So there's a few papers out and everything. We have done the preliminary studies, and the other next I really wanted to see it because I'd never really seen it before was to pick up the signature of the antipode on the other side of the world. What What's is the that? antipode? What is that? Uh, the antipode is if, if you know Earth being a sphere, you have at one point is the opposite polar point. Okay. So the opposite point of a sphere. And uh, the antipode of Kazakhstan, the closest station we have to it, is in Russia, is in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. So we went, uh, it, basically, once we got three days of data, the first thing I did is like, oh, did we pick it up? Yes, we did. Not just the first great circle, so it goes like through the shortest path, then it goes through the longest path, then it wrapped around, and then it came in again. And it arrived twice. So here's a, here's a little thought about spherical geometry. When you think of sound, right, you think of it spreading out and dissipating, right, and becoming fainter and fainter as it yeah. goes away, right? Yeah. yeah. When you're in a sphere and at very low frequencies, you have very little attenuation, it, it does spread out geometrically, but then it comes back together again at the bottom end. So it reconverges. Mm -hmm. And then it spreads out again, and then it reconverges again. So we could see that actually. This kind of was this something you knew already to knew you knew to expect, 
or was this something that was, you know, that, that became uh, visible, uh, confirmed by what happened with the media? We um we expected it from a theoretical armworthy thing, but to confirm it yeah. was extremely satisfying. That's pretty exciting, yeah. <laughs> okay, so so now you have all this data, mm -hmm. and you can see things that maybe you never saw before because you have data from various places about and that were you know very well recorded, um, and you put it on the computer, and it was so exciting. And said, what what did you learn? learn by it about the meteor i mean you know so many issues i mean you have to you have to detract for the weather right you have to compensate for weather changes in all this um you have to find the perfect the pure the pure wave effect of just the meteor now so when, when were you able to find a pure wave effect for the media that satisfied you scientifically well if it was a single point it would be a lot easier but this thing actually was moving, was booking it. It was moving extremely fast. And it was actually a line. And it was breaking up as it radiated. So you don't have, you, you can create an equivalent source, but a, it is a very complex process of fragmentation, of burning up as it comes in. And what you can reconstruct is where the energy was deposited as a function of time over its you know, 10, 15 second history. In 1050 seconds, this thing crossed like, you know, hundreds of kilometers. And so it's a very fast track and breaking up as it goes and eventually landing on the on the lake, right? Because yeah. you found a big rock over there. So part of the part of the real challenge is to be able to reconstruct the trajectory and energy deposition. And uh, we're basically still working on refining it, but there's uh, two papers in Nature and one in Science that did a really good job of at least starting with, this is what we think happened. And do you know what they used? What? They use um, cameras all over Russia. What? It's like using YouTube. You mean to, to track it, to track it as it went down. Yeah. Video Theoretical cameras. Yes. Just tracking the meteor as it crossed the sky. Ubiquitous sensing system that people have like, on lights and security cameras that are fixed in space and time. And they actually reconstructed the trajectory from essentially ubiquitous sensing systems that are pre existing, an existing network that you stepped into. So how does the ubiquitous uh, sensing system that gives you a trajectory of the meteor coming down, how does that, how, how does that interplay with your sound, your sound interpretation of the sound of the media and all you know, the secondary sound that it involved when it hit? Well, this happened to fall over a very heavily populated and densely instrumented region, but we have many other events of this magnitude that will fall in the middle of nowhere. Uh, there are some of the of the shoreline of Indonesia that we have very little ground truth on, so we have to interpret it using whatever we have, which is usually satellite and infrasound. That's usually it. And there was one uh, just a few, uh, just about a month ago, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the Atlantic and um, the South uh, Atlantic, that again, very little data is available for. So often we have to be able to reconstruct these things using whatever information we have over very poorly monitored regions. Well, it sounds like, you know, you're going to be looking for any information you you can possibly find about this event from whatever source and then you're going to you're going to somehow uh, interpret that information into a model uh, and use everything you can possibly use and then you're going to come out with uh, gee, I don't know what you're going to come out. What are you going to come out with at the end of the day? What is <laughs> I, you know, I I know that at the end of the day we're going to have an article in the journal Nature, I know that's coming, and you guys are going to write it. Am I right? <laughs> well, it's, it's, what it's are you going to say in that article? <laughs> One of my uh, my colleagues, um, um, Peter Brown, he's uh, and uh, and and our host of us actually already put one. And one of the products that comes out is uh, our, what is the probability of getting hit by these things per year, per every ten years? Okay, and that allows you to kind of prepare, at least know to what to expect. Is this uh, acceptable? Is this increasing? Is it decreasing? And uh, this is one of those civil defense response type of uh, situations. Not dissimilar from nuclear test ban monitoring. It's really similar. You know? Well, let's take a, one more last break. And uh, when we come back, I, I'd like to know uh, 
whether it's Brian or somebody else who's doing all the programming on this, because it sounds very sophisticated. That's Milton Garces and Brian Williams of the Infrasound Institute in the Big Island joining us by Skype here on Think Tech Talks, uh, the So West Hour on, on every Monday. And we'll be right back after this break. Aloha, I'm Maria Kashem of Think Tech Hawaii, and I want to tell you about our Think Tech talk shows. If you didn't know it, Think Tech streams video and audio for all of its shows live on the internet from 2 to 5 p.m. every weekday afternoon, and we replay them all night long on Ustream.tv. Visit ThinkTechHawaii.com for our live stream and YouTube links. Raise your awareness on Think Tech. I'm Maria Kashem, and I'll see you. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel of Think Tech. We have some news for you. In addition to our Think Tech TV show and our Asia in Review show on Olelo 54, as of January 1st, we're adding Community Matters to play also two hours a week. Check out thinktechaway.com for the specific times of each of these shows. We hope you enjoy all three. Mahalo, I'm Jay Fidel. Well, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech Talks. I'm Jay Fidel. It's Monday, and that means it's the SOAST Hour. Uh, today with Milton Garces and Brian Williams, who join us by Skype from the Big Island there with the Infrasound Institute, which is part of the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology in SOAST here on the SOAST Hour. So, um, you know, the interpretation, and Brian, could you give us a handle on what tools are available, software or otherwise, to make interpretation uh, of all this incredible data you've been getting and the likelihood that you're gonna, that's going to increase going forward? You're going to get so much data. What are you going to do with it in order to, you know, in order to make those conclusions? Well, yeah, first of all, like you said, um, eventually we're going to have to deal with all, all sorts of data. And that's kind of where we're at right now is trying to figure out how to collect um, data from cell phones is one of our future projects. And so just managing all these data streams is a huge, huge uh, endeavor that we're, we're uh, starting to, uh, to uh, work on. But uh, for right now, uh, we're using uh, MATLAB, which is a coding uh, language. Uh, so we basically get the data in and we do certain processing, uh, um, looking at signal, signal to noise and uh, uh, other aspects of the data to, uh, to help uh, figure out if this data is useful. Uh, sometimes uh, we have noise of you know, different sorts and uh, that noise could uh, skew our um, energy levels of the so-called data. Uh, like um, in the meter, uh, the meteorite study, uh, what was the signal to noise ra uh, ratio that we were using? It was it's like a 24 decibels, which is like yeah. orders of magnitude higher. It was, it was yeah. massive. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so Matt, we use MATLAB. Uh, we also have a program called PMCC, which does a uh, correlation between the networks, uh, the, the antennas, if you will, of, uh, of the micro uh, microbarometers. And from that, we can uh, pinpoint uh, the, the azimuth of uh, the source, uh, like we were talking, discussing earlier. And uh, so, yeah, we basically, we, we can get, uh, you know, the timing of the event, uh, the azimuth from where it's going, and then we're also uh, estimating uh, the, the strength of the source. So, for example, the meteor comes down and you see a high point uh, on intensity at a certain instant moment in time. You know um, that's when it's struck, right? You can, you can identify right down to the second or millisecond exactly uh, when it struck. That's a high point in, in, in sound, right? Well, yeah, uh, I mean, and then again, we have, uh, like uh, Milton was saying, we have all these uh, other sources to help constrain the time. But yeah, I mean, we, we look on the uh, waveform and uh, we look for a peak uh, of, of power and, and whatnot. You know, when I look at this video and I apply, you know, off the shelf uh, sound software from uh, Adobe or, uh, or Apple, like Final Cut Pro, There'll be something in there to identify a base load of sound of noise. It might be, uh, you know, the fan over your head or the air conditioning in that room, and I'll identify that exact sound wave, and then I'm able to subtract it out. You must use the same conceptually, the same kind of technology. 
uh, once you identify a sound wave you don't want, uh, I don't know why antipode comes to mind, maybe that's not the right word, but <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to learn here. Um, but once you identify this baseline sound load that you don't care about, you, you can subtract it out, right, to get the pure sound that will help you make your conclusions. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we, we do uh, uh, filtering, yeah. So, I mean, maybe you're going to look at uh, Apple uh, Final Cut Pro or Adobe Premiere and see what they got for you. I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, no, I, I use um, Adobe um, Audition quite a bit. Once uh, A lot of the things we do is sonification. We turn this completely inaudible sound fields and into the realm of the audible. And there's a pretty big collection, uh, both on our webpage at isla.hawaii.edu and also in SoundCloud. A SoundCloud under um, iSound Hunter, uh, you find uh, about 15 year collection of um, volcano, volcano data that's been sped up or somehow modified so you can experience it. Okay, so the one I remember is isla, I S L A dot what? EDU. Dot Hawaii dot EDU, yes. Yeah. And, and then the other one is um, Infrasound Hunter, and uh, that's a Twitter handle as well as a SoundCloud a repository of uh, volcanic sounds. So I sound hunter. Okay. There's one thing that Brian said that struck me, and that was the thing about smartphones, uh, that you could get sound from smartphones. Does this mean that uh, somebody in uh, you know the Ukraine is uh, going to stand up and point his smartphone to the heaven, uh, and you're going to get sound off that and put it into your you know data analysis? Uh, I didn't understand where the smartphone played, what role the smartphone played. They could be used as portals also. Uh, you can design a sensor or use what's on board to collect at least a certain range of sound. Uh, it wouldn't be as good as your, um, as your off-the-shelf specialized product, but it will provide coverage, and that in itself is useful. So, for example, for the reconstruction of the Russian meteor, they use cameras that are not meant for astronomical observations, yet they could reconstruct and obtain a lot of information from that. So you, now you're entering an era of big data, essentially, where you compromise perhaps quality over quantity. And so you have a lot more, and eventually quality grows with it, but part of how to embrace that world in the digital science is in many ways we're behind the curve on this. Uh, a lot of people in the, in, those, in the, for example, medicine and also um, economy and also uh, text mining, the NSA comes to mind, already do this. They already look for large amounts of data and then it's like, oh, look, this is what we have. We have a pattern here. So starting to think that way, I think, is the way of the future. Yeah, well, that, yes, I, I, mean, I think it applies to, to everything these days. Uh, big, big data and then sophisticated tools to mine that data and make, and make good conclusions. You're right, you're right in the middle. So is that your big challenge? Are you also developing uh, software to do that sort of thing, to go through the big data and find the needle in the haystack? Uh, we, we've been there for years, actually. We're swimming in the dark stuff. But, uh, before, <laughs> we used to like, be so happy with the one little data set. Now we're giving it away, actually. If, if there's some, um, essentially there's a cloud for data now. It's, it's called Iris. Uh, and if you go to the Iris webpage, you can download a whole bunch of infrasound data in real time now. So we're ready to turn the page where we're giving this stuff away. Come, could somebody please use it? Make make the best <laughs> use of it. Seriously, we're It'll swimming. It'll the kids in the science uh, science class at Iolani High School. I hope so. I really hope so because there's just too much of it, and we need to make the best use of it. And we need people. <laughs> so uh, tell me your challenges. What you see, you're going to have to work on to get to the next chapter. And then tell me what the next chapter is, you guys. You have a, a minute or two to finish. Well, um, I think the, we already made some efforts in standardizing. This field is so new that we don't have established standards for a lot of our metrics. You know, for most fields, you have them, length and time and all that. But we already tagged on audio standards to basically stabilize our metrics. And then um, the next one was start processing things in this reproducible, standardized methodology that we can share results and make them available very quickly. And this is, I think, building the infrastructure for that. It's a bit of a paradigm shift for us. We really have to start thinking about large numbers of results that we can start associating and correlating with each other. And that is a bit of a shift for the geosciences, but I think it's happening and, uh, and we are on a way to doing that. 
That's fabulous. What an interesting discussion. What an interesting subject. I hope you don't mind, but I'd like to, you know, circle back with you in a few months and see how it's going, learn more, <laughs> drill down, and all that. All right. Thank you so much, Milton Garces, director of the Infrastown Institute, and Brian Williams, also of the Institute, both involved in the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at SOAST. Here on the SOAST Hour, they have joined us from the Big Island in their laboratory. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Next, Aloha. next up is uh, Ehana Kako with Kali'i Akina. We'll be right back for that in a few minutes.